Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and Marvel's Eternals just released in 4K, allowing us to spot lots of new details. So I'm gonna scrub back through this movie frame by frame to break down the new goodies. Now I will be covering some stuff that I already covered in my opening weekend breakdown. I'm sorry to repeat myself, but you know, not everyone caught this movie when it came out, and I wanna try to be as comprehensive as Erishim is when he tells Cersei how pointless everything is. The film opens with a Star Wars style scrawl, beginning with the words, in the beginning. The first three words of the Bible, of course, establishing this film as its own book of Genesis of the MCU. It mentions the six singularities, capital S, lending some sacred status to the six infinity stones. And the number six may connect to the celestials having six eyes. Now, if the celestials predate the Big Bang, what universe existed before? This could also remind you of Galactus, who in Marvel lore was an explorer named Galen who lived in the pre-Big Bang universe. Now, the script also says the unnatural deviants came from deep space and that the Eternals came from a planet named Olympia making all this a lie. Like, should we also doubt the peaceful balance boasted here? Especially if you look closely, Erishem appears to have some interesting battle scars cracked into his armor, suggesting he might have been involved in some past celestial conflict that might have caused the beheading of the celestial nowhere. On the domo, the craggy statue of Erishem beams together the speaking sphere from a hand that I just noticed this and makes this shape, which in ASL means asshole. Dude, come on, Makari is sitting right in front of you. It's just a appropriate that this celestial a-hole greets us like this. Now, as that cosmic energy activates each of the Eternals, it starts with Ajax, then strings to Cersei, then to Drig, which might show us the order of succession because Cersei replaces Ajax, and after her, Druig was really the most outspoken leader. Icarus is at the far end of that, though, the last one to be activated, showing how he was never intended to be the real leader of this group. He was really just a soldier who blindly follows orders. And since we later learn these are all synthetic beings, it's just awesome that they all boot up as a kind of electrical circuit like nodes on a string of Christmas lights. Now framed in the sunlight of Earth, dead center is Mesopotamia, which anthropologists have called the Fertile Crescent of human civilization. The date is 5000 BC, which really is our earliest records of civilization dating back to the ancient Sumerians who started in this region. Now our first shot of human technology in this film is this close up of a dull blade used to flay a fish, the same tool that Cersei later at the end of the sequence transforms into a more ornate and sharp sharper dagger, and this is actually based on a real-life relic recovered from a royal tomb in the Sumerian port city of Ur, which we are probably looking at here. Now you'll notice the Predator Deviant has four eyes, one rung down from the Celestial Six Eyes, but one rung up from Humans and Eternals. Just little evidence showing that the Celestials actually created the Deviants first before the Eternals and Humans. Now as you've noticed by watching these videos, it's rare that I ever get cold feet when it comes to a theory, but sometimes I get cold feet because my feet are literally wet. Wet socks! suck, especially this time of year. But to keep your toes warm and dry, you don't have to resort to wearing some big old nasty boots. You can wear some sleek, comfortable Vessi shoes. Thank you to Vessi for sponsoring this video. Vessi's are the perfect everyday shoe. They are sustainably made knit sneakers that are 100% waterproof to keep your winter feet dry and warm without any of the clunkiness of boots. And as a bonus, they're great in warm weather too. Like me, these bad boys work all day, every day. They are made with this Dymatex material that is super easy to clean with just a rinse of water. Oh no! I spilled water all over my feetsy weetsies, but my oinky oinkies are bone dry like the dune sea. Thanks, Vessie. Whatever the season, Vessies are a truly everyday shoe. Banish those soggy socks forever! I don't know what accent this is. I'm just excited about these shoes! So check out Vessi in the link below and use the code NEWROCKSTARS to get $25 off your Vessi shoes. The Eternals, Icarus, Makari, Kingo, and Gilgamesh, and Thena take down the Deviants. Icarus throughout this is framed with the glare of the sun behind him as he later is in this movie at Babylon, foreshadowing his fate flying directly into the sun like the mythological narrative of Icarus that's bright based on him. The Domo looms into view on the coast in a dark rectangular shape and frame, evoking the mysterious arrival of the monolith in Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, which also reframes the dawn of man and the advent of technology with extraterrestrial guidance. You'll notice how the stitching on all the Eternals' outfits and their tech and their energy takes the form of circles, concentric circles, overlapping circles, symbolizing their own true nature as synthetic beings locked in a cycle with no beginning, no end of planetary caretaking and destruction to gestate the birth of new celestials. Now, the moment Cersei gives the dagger to the boy evokes Michelangelo's creation of Adam when God sparked consciousness into mankind, a painting which Michelangelo awesomely designed, framing God in the shape of a human brain. 
consciousness from within. This close up of the hands touching each other on the beach also mirrors one of the closing shots of the film when Cersei gives Sprite the gift of mortality like the Blue Fairy with Pinocchio. Now the music we hear here is Pink Floyd's Time, the opening track of their album Dark Side of the Moon. The lyrics lament losing track of time, kicking around on a piece of the ground, waiting for someone or something to show you the way. The Eternals have been stuck on Earth burning time for centuries for millennia, waiting for further instructions from the Celestials. The Marvel Studios title card, which normally flashes pages of Avengers comics, now instead flashes comic artwork from Jack Kirby depicting the Celestials, and then it fades in Iron Man and the rest. Also, you'll notice Shang-Chi has been added to the M of Marvel Studios. In London, above the screen for that dagger is a promo for the GRC, Global Repatriation Council, which we learn about in the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. That's the organization that resettles victims of Thanos' snap after the blip. At London's Natural History Museum, Cersei eyes a whale skeleton. Actually, in a deleted scene, Sprite projects over these fossils the flesh of deviants, suggesting that Cersei may actually be wary of the predator that these remains used to be. And she greets Charles Darwin as Charlie, meaning his whole theory of evolution probably came from some chats with her. Dane Whitman quotes the poet Walt Whitman. In this broad earth of ours, amid the measureless grossness and the slag, enclosed and safe within its central heart, nestles the seed perfection. Foreshadowing the seed of the celestial Tiamat nestled in the central heart of this broad earth. Cersei, meanwhile, lectures about apex predators, which also foreshadows the Eternals' coming conflict with the deviants in this movie. Cersei gives Dane this ring for the Middle Ages with his family crest. It depicts a raven with its wings folded back. This is the crest of the Black Knight, Marvel's bearer of the ebony blade, dating all the way back to Dane's ancestor of Sir Percy of Scandia, a contemporary of Merlin and King Arthur. Later on in the film, Cersei talks to Dane about his uncle, and in the final scene, Dane begins to tell her about that. Turns out my family history is complicated. All setting up the post credit scene where Dane finds himself in the mansion of his uncle and recovers the ebony blade in a box marked Mors Mihi Lucrum, Death is My Reward, and he hears this voice. Sure you're ready for that, Mr. Whitman? That is Mahershala Ali as Marvel's Blade, setting up a possible team up between these two. In the comics, they both work on a supernatural fighting team, MI-13, but I'm wondering in the MCU, they might work together as part of the Midnight Suns alongside Moon Knight. In the Camden Lock part of London, you'll notice the band posters on the wall include mentions of Electric God and Stick to the Plan, kind of like these electrical analog gods are really tasked with sticking to Ersham's plan. Now, when Sprite falls, her illusions fade because unlike Loki, her illusions aren't tangible duplication casting, a distinction that Loki explained in his series. Illusion projection involves depicting a detailed image from outside oneself which is perceptible in the external world, whereas duplication casting entails recreating an exact facsimile of one's own body in its present circumstance, which acts as a true holographic mirror of its molecular structure. Now the mural behind this whole deviant fight depicts a tiger, a wolf, a rhino, and more, framing the deviant as yet another apex predator. Richard Madden and Kit Harington give each other a knowing look when they meet, recalling their past screen time together on Game of Thrones, where the last words they exchanged were, Next time I see you, you'll be all in black. It was always my color. And now he is greeting Marvel's Black Knight. Dane asks, Why didn't you guys help fight Thanos? Or any war, all the other terrible things throughout history. Now, genealogically, Thanos is an eternal, but born with a deviant gene. Actually, Chloe Zhao explained in an interview with Empire that Thanos and his brother Eros were Eternals with similar roles on the planet Titan, and that she imagined this as why Thanos was so worried about overpopulation while Eros deserted his mission. They watch MCU news service WHIH on the TV, and you'll notice how Sprite unsheaths that dagger. This is the same dagger that she uses to stab Cersei in the back during the final battle. The Babylon battle goes down in front of the famous Ishtar Gate of Babylon, pieces of which can also now be found in museums, Inside that city are the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Ajax is summoned to Erishim, voiced by David Kay, who voices Optimus Prime in the Transformers. This first shot only shows part of his massive head and it's impossible for us to take him all in at once at this point in the movie. Really, he's only personified through his voice and through his eye holes, of which we only see four, which is the number of deviant eyes, giving him a more menacing appearance here. I also like how Chloe Zhao uses Ajax's tiny, tiny body to give us a sense of scale in comparison to the eye holes. So, when Tiamat rises from the Indian Ocean, and when Ersham returns to the sky in the final scene, we now know from these opening shots how immense these things truly are. Now, at the Feast Sprite reframes the battle that they just witnessed into the actual epic of Gilgamesh from our history, mentioning both Gilgamesh and Enkidu, a character from the epic 
whom Gilgamesh defeats, and then the two become friends. Makari barters for the Emerald Tablet, which is another real world relic of cryptic hermetic text that's poured over by Islamic and European alchemists who associated it with the Philosopher's Stone as a means of producing gold and contains the famous derived passage, as above, so below, which is kind of cool to think about in the context of the Celestials, right? As they are above, so is another celestial below our feet. Cersei tries to show Icarus how to make their bread, and he just chucks the dough down sloppily, but she gently pats it flat. I just like this little gesture setting up the conflict in the final battle. Icarus just makes a mess of everything, but Cersei wins by knowing exactly how to lay her hands. Now, in their wedding, I love this shot of the other Eternals. Sprite looks pissed because she's envious. She's the Tinkerbell to this Peter Pan, and Thena gives this apprehensive stare because she never fully trusted Icarus. Now, as they drive up to Ajax's ranch in South Dakota, notice how the terrain is cracked. Their car has to hop over it, just showing how that earthquake that they felt in London was really a worldwide one preceding Tiamat's emergence. Now, heading into the house, Icarus Chris is the last one to walk in, since he knows what they're going to find and he doesn't want the other two to see and judge his reaction. Though technically, he doesn't lie when he says what killed her exactly. It was a deviant. Because as we see later on, all he does is really push her into that ice glacier pit and it's the deviants who kill her. But after Cersei becomes the prime eternal, Icarus's envy reveals itself. Did you talk with Arisham? Are you sure you talked to Tharsham? Which is why instead he suggests that she just might be suffering from Mad Weary. And to figure out what Mad Weary is, we flash back to the Eternals debating over that 1521 Spanish conquest of the Aztec Empire at Tenochtitlan. Sorry, I mispronounced it. Though we should note, despite Druig ending this particular battle, Spanish forces overall still conquered the Americas at that time, thanks in part to carrying diseases with them like smallpox. Athena's Mad Weary kicks in, and she and Ajax duel. Ajax gets stabbed in her palm, making a stigmata wound, and later gets stabbed stabbed in her side as Christ was at the time of his crucifixion, foretelling her own martyrdom. Notice how Ajax almost snaps Thena out of it. If you are safe, if you are loved, if you are Thena. Yes, those gunshots are what return Thena's mind to violence, showing that it's really human genocide that triggers her memories of the genocide that they committed on other planets. Kingo stars in a Bollywood film where his costume is based on Icarus's design. He introduces them to Karun. Oh, Karun, he's worked with me for 50 years. I trust him completely. Actually, when we first met, he thought I was a vampire, and he tried to stake me through the heart. Yes, a little reminder that vampires do exist in the MCU, setting up Blade's cameo in the post credit scene. Then Kingo says, I can't just go. I mean, all these people depend on me. We just started shooting this movie. It's the first of a trilogy. We just got BTS to do a cameo. I, I, I like the meta nods here to Marvel's own franchise building and how they were able to score a massive pop star to do a cameo in this movie. Then on Kingo's private jet, he collects Captain America's original shield from the first Cap film. And if you remember, the guards in the background of his Bollywood number also carry shields with a similar design pattern as Captain America's. You'll notice on the TV screen behind Icarus throughout the scene actually plays the Empire Strikes Back, the scene where Han is frozen in the carbonite. In Kingo's documentary, Cersei says, I can change a rock into water. I, I could turn a rock into wood or a rock into metal. Kingo brushes it off, but this does seem to foreshadow Cersei's miraculous transfiguration in the final battle. Behind Kingo is six movie posters showing his various Bollywood franchises over five generations, all of which would have been within a hundred years of cinema's existence, which means Kingo refused to wait for whatever branch of his family tree to just get slightly older, and instead, like after 15 or 20 years or so, would just change his facial hair to play whoever this famous actor's still handsome son is. Like he didn't bother spacing it out to just like three generations of himself. In Australia, Gilgamesh meets Karun. I'm Karun, Kingo's valet. Oh, valet, like Alfred in Batman. Yes, one of two DC references made in this film, along with... Jack, that's Superman. Jack, it's really funny, Jack. No, that is no, definitely not he Superman. Is Superman. This is part of Chloe Zhao's goal to really embrace all of superhero mythology as something that was really rooted in Eternals history. Thena suffers from Mad Weary again. Everyone in Century 6 is going to die. We can't save them. Yes, Century 6 is a lesser planet for Marvel Comics from Thor 256, a planet whose population gets sold into slavery. Here, this was a past planet that the Eternals helped the Celestials destroy to sprout a new Celestial baby. As Sprite turns Gilgamesh into a big baby, he says, Yours is a secret rule. 
Alden taught me as a thank you oh after God. we helped defeat Lofi's army in Tonsberg. <laughs> yeah, this is a huge detail that I missed before. The Battle of Tonsberg in 965 AD that was seen in the Thor prologue when Odin beat the Frost Giants and took Loki as his ward. This whole battle was won thanks to help from the Eternals, meaning Odin knew about the Eternals, they were all friends, and if Odin knew about them, and if Thor followed Kingo around as a kid, characters like Loki, like Hela and Valkyrie might also know about the Eternals. And yeah, we do hear Kingo say, Thor used to follow me around when he was a little kid. Now he's a famous Avenger and won't return my calls. I just would love to see this relationship pursued further in titles like Thor Love and Thunder, a movie that's gonna have a villain like Gore the God Butcher, who I think might be targeting all celestial linked deity figures. Sprite says, So now that Captain Rogers and Iron Man are both gone, who do you think's gonna lead the Avengers? I could lead them. Yeah, I like how Sprite calls Steve Captain Rogers, meaning of course they were aware of him back in the 1940s when he was an army soldier, and also might be a nod to the fact that Captain America in the MCU is technically now Sam Wilson. Cersei communes with Arishim, and I love how this guy is always revealing himself his huge massive frame just on the other side of whatever nearby surfaces they're in in Earth. Like he's always right there, leaning in your face, watching. And some more amazing scale here as we zoom out from Cersei and then a massive wall of red blocks her from our view, which then reveals itself as just one of Erishim's fingers. Erishim depicts Tiamat's terrifying emergence from Earth, Tiamat's hand crashing up through the crust causes the power grids of all the nearby cities to flicker out. Actually, before the whole cities flicker out, you can see the little tiny power plants of those cities flickering out first. We visit the World Forge, which has tunnels snaking into it with tiny bits of light, which are for each Eternal returning to be rebooted here. The interior of the forge is structured with a steampunk design of gears and rings like the inside of a clock. As Erishim explains the Deviant's evolution, one Deviant attacks these green-skinned humanoids. We might be looking at early versions of scrolls because the scrolls originally from the planet Torfa, and the scrolls were considered the deviant strain of that species. Then on to Druig's Amazon village, we see a blacksmith hammering away, like Tony Stark in the cave in Iron Man. Actually, come to think, the way Fastos designs all of his technology in this movie, using his holographic interface, is also pretty similar to the way Stark operates. When Dane calls Cersei, playing Lizzo's Juice, notice the photo on her screen shows Dane with his Black Knight Raven family ring. That ring is framed once again during their FaceTime. What about King Midas? Everything he touched turned to Gold. Was that you? Dane. Call your uncle. What? My uncle? No. So you've always wanted to make amends with him, right? Now, Dane Whitman's uncle is Nathan Garrett, the previous villainous Black Knight from whom Dane inherits a castle and finds the Ebony Blade, which is where that post credit scene takes place. In this scene, he also calls Cersei King Midas, setting up her reverse Midas scene, Tiamat's golden body, into marble. Now, when the Deviants attack the camp, Sprite clears Karun out of there. How many cameras did you bring, young man? Yeah, I love how she calls him young man. And then Kago gets his big move. Did you? Now, Deshoom is a kind of onomatopoeia that's used in Bollywood movies for flesh on flesh hits like kapow or blam. But this is my favorite kill of the movie, simply for the practical effect of all that green blood spilling all over Kamel Nanjiani's face. Cersei turns a deviant into a tree, showing that she actually can transform sentient beings, despite her belief otherwise, and of course, setting up her ability to do this to Tiamat. The alpha deviant kills Gilgamesh and absorbs his life force, turning him into a more humanoid form of Crow, voiced by Pennywise actor Bill Skarsgård, who accuses the Eternals of hunting his kind. You are not saviors, Eternals. You are murderers. And then we meet Fastos at the site of Hiroshima, August 8th, 1945, the day American forces dropped an atomic bomb on the city. Fastos tells his husband and son that Icarus and Cersei are named Isaac and Sylvia, a nod to their human aliases in the comics of Isaac, Ike, Harris, and Sylvia Cersei. Inside, Icarus reads a Star Wars coloring book, and then he wrecks Fastos's table. What's this even made of? Vibranium. <laughs> Fall collection. Ikea. You could read this as a subtle implication that Fastos might have at least helped the Wakandans craft their vibranium into the technology they have. They dig back up their Domo ship in Iraq and join Makari, who wears a shirt for H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, a story with a similar plot about extraterrestrial world enders who end up unsuccessful. Kingo calls her Miss Havisham, referencing the hoarder of Charles Dickens' Great Expectations. And we see how Makari has collected a ton of stuff from throughout history. An ancient Egyptian statue of the deity Bastet, a painting called La Laison de Musique, which hangs in the Louvre, a Roman an imperial eagle staff with SPQR for Sonatus Populus K. Romanus, a Big Mac and its carton, the holy freaking grail that's the same design from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, the Camara of Arezzo statue, which in real life resides in the National Archaeological Museum of Florence, a throne that is not the UK St. Edward's chair, but at least one similar to it, a medieval suit of armor, and a PlayStation VR headset. Thena and Sprite play with this stuff. Is that the Ebony Blade? Excalibur. 
Arthur always did have a crush on you. Confirming that these Eternals were really part of Dane's family history as well. And then Icarus and Jurek trade some Twinkies for that Emerald tablet they were talking about before. So let's jump ahead to the emergence happening. Makari sprints across the world and we see some fun landmarks. The Glenfinnan Viaduct of Scotland and then the Christ the Redeemer statue of Rio de Janeiro. Then she stops in the Indian Ocean where we see some nearby oil platforms drilling, baby drilling. This could be a spot of a crust that is filled with oil pockets, making it a bit thinner for Tiamat to crash up through. During this battle, Cersei transfigures the volcanic rock into a flock of birds, the same kind of move Doctor Strange pulled against Thanos in Infinity War, making her that kind of Doctor Strange wizard that Dane accused her of being. Are you a wizard like Doctor Strange? And during this final battle, Icarus angrily fires his laser eyes at the sky, evoking an iconic frame of Icarus from the comics, and Tiamat rises out of the Indian Ocean. Folks, this is crazy. It really should create an insane seismic event that would destroy most of the planet. But it looks awesome, and I love the fact that in the MCU now, there is just a giant celestial head and hand poking out of the Indian Ocean. In the comics, the corpse of a celestial is actually used for Avengers HQ at some point. That'd be a really fun place to put Avengers HQ now. But Cersei is the victor of the hour. She's the one who transfigures him into marble. And this process is really a uni mind that links all of them, including Tiamat, and we see them being linked in the following order. Cersei, then Druig, then Sprite, then Fastos and Makari, then Thena, then Icarus. If you think about it, this was the same exact order they were in back on the Domo in the opening sequence, but of course, sadly, Ajax and Gilgamesh removed from that. Even in the uni mind, there is an order of succession here. Now, Icarus's memories of Cersei rewind backward through their time together back to their wedding day and their time in Babylon in the first moment they set eyes on Earth from space when Cersei said, It's beautiful, isn't it? Yes, reminded of the word beautiful, the same word that Icarus tried to teach him himself in the Babylonian language to Cersei the day he proposed, leading him to fly into the sun. Though I have a good feeling this guy survived, probably popped out the other end with more powers. But after Sprite is turned into a mortal, the movie ends with Thena, Druig, and Makari departing Earth on the Domo to seek out other Eternals and other planets, while Kingo, Sprite, and Cersei stay behind on Earth. And in that final scene, as Dane begins to tell Cersei about his family history being complicated, clouds form in the sky and Ersham appears, zipping Cersei up to him, along with Fastos and Kingo, and he says, You have chosen to sacrifice a celestial for the people of this planet. I will spare them, but your memories will show if they are worthy to live, and I will return for judgment. Allowing him to complete his arc to become his title from the comics, Erishim the Judge. And rather than every other time we've seen him disappear, just dematerializing out of view as if lowering a curtain in front of him, now we see him kind of zip into his own black hole, folding in on himself. Now the post credit scenes introduce us to Harry freaking Styles as Eros, brother to Thanos, and his buddy Pip the Troll, voiced by Patton Oswalt, actually learned of a conceived alternate ending to this scene that was actually shot, according to Lauren Ridloff, that would have shown this group actually communing with Erishim. And then of of course, the second post credit scene, confirming Dane Whitman's destiny as the Black Knight, finding the Ebony Blade in his Uncle Nathan's mansion, and I love the little detail of the surface of that blade reaching out to his fingers, a blade that is calling to him. That's all the new stuff I found, and you can support New Rockstars by checking out our merch options at newrockstarsmerch.com, follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EABoss, follow New Rockstars, and subscribe for breakdowns of everything you love. Thanks for watching, bye. <laughs>